Hey guys, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Campaigns of Alexander by Arian. Um, so, uh, Arian uh, was a 2nd century Greek writer. Uh, he was probably born in 90 AD. It's kind of unclear when he was born. Uh, we actually don't know that much about him. Um, aside from that, he served as a consul in Rome uh, starting in 130 AD, and you need to be at least 40 to serve as a consul, so in 130 he must have at least been 40, so he must have been born, um, no later than 90, uh, if you do the math. Um, but we do know that he was, uh, uh, came from money, he was an aristocratic Greek, he was educated, he was actually a pupil of Epictetus, who was, um, uh, a Greek philosopher, very important in the Stoic school of philosophy. Uh, and he was also actually a friend of Emperor Hadrian, uh, and again served as consul. And he probably wrote the campaigns of Alexander during the reign of Hadrian at some point. So around 117 to 130 AD, although it's hard to really know precisely when he wrote it. Um, and Arian actually wrote uh, prolifically. He wrote a ton. He wrote his whole life. Um, but very little of that actually survives. This, of course, being one. Uh, another one is a book about India that he wrote, um, uh, but obviously this is uh, the most important work that survives from him, um, and the one that I'm talking about. So, uh, The Campaigns of Alexander. Um, this is this book has for a long time been known as uh, one of the most uh, important and uh, detailed and um, reliable accounts of Alexander the Great's reign. Um, so it, it begins when Alexander takes over as king of Macedon. So it has nothing about his childhood, or his. it has very little about his mother, or his father, or his upbringing. It starts right when he becomes king. Uh, Alexander became king of Macedon in 336 BC. Um, so this is well before the rise of the Roman Empire. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Alexander the Great was is a famous king of Macedon. Macedon was uh, a kingdom just north of Greece. Uh, it was a very Grecianized kingdom, if, or I'm not sure that's a word, but very, very Greek influenced. Uh, although the Macedonians were considered a separate ethnic group, and uh, Alexander the Great's father, Philip the um, Second, laid a lot of the groundwork for Alexander the Great's reign because he reformed, did, instituted a lot of reforms in the Macedonian military, introduced new weapons to the Macedonian military, and um, subjected the Greek city states as well. Um, and so he left Alexander this uh, big uh, and up-and-coming kingdom. And also Philip had been planning to invade uh, Persia, the Persian Empire, which was the great superpower at the time. Um, it, you know, the Persian Empire was the biggest empire that had been seen up to that point. Um, it spanned from what we now know as uh, Turkey to all the way to what we now call Afghanistan and Pakistan. So, uh, and all the way down to Egypt and uh, the northern parts of what are now uh, Arabia and, and Iraq. Um, so it was a huge empire, uh, and uh, Philip was planning to invade it upon his death. And uh, he was assassinated under mysterious, mysterious circumstances. It's a little it's a little unclear whether some enemy paid for him to be assassinated, uh, and if and if that is the case, then who? Um, but uh, because he had he had enemies, I mean, obviously the Persian, the king of Persia, Darius, uh, could view them as an as a threat because he he was an up and coming king and he had just taken over Greece and he was planning to invade Persia. <laughs> um, but Philip also had enemies in Greece because obviously there were some people in Greece who were not happy with their new Macedonian overlords. Um, so it's unclear who, who actually had uh, Philip killed, uh, but Alexander was certain that it was the Persians, so he used that as an excuse to uh, invade Persia. Uh, he also, uh, Alexander also listed a number of other uh, atrocities that the Persians supposedly committed that um, that he was supposedly avenging, and it is true that the Persians did invade Greece a few times, uh, as told by Herodotus. Um, so it's not like the Persians hadn't done anything against the Greeks, but it, it's it's not really clear that Darius himself, as king of Persia, did that much uh, that was terrible to the Greeks. But anyway, Alexander the Great said that he did and used it as an excuse to rally his Greek and Macedonian troops and invade Persia. Uh, and he did so, and he conquered Persia in um, spectacular fa fashion. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the two sort of legendary battles of Issus and Gaugamela are these really incredible military events, uh, where Alexander had an army of maybe 40,000 or so, 40-50,000, uh, and Darius had 
armies of in the hundreds of thousands, you know, 300,000, 400,000. Uh, Arian claims that his armies were almost to a million, um, but that's probably inflated, um, as the editors of this volume say, and that is one of the one of the things to look out for with Arian and a lot of these old historians is that they're not always they're not always to be trusted, even though they often are. Um, but that's a good thing about have a having a critical volume, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so Alexander the Great, the Great defeats the Persians, defeats Darius at the Battle of Galgamela. The Battle of Galgamela is really the central battle where Darius's power just collapsed. Uh, you know, his army was crushingly defeated and uh, but Darius escaped the battle um he had really no more power because no one not many people followed him anymore and Alexander was you know entered the capital of the Persian Empire Persepolis and Babylon and, and Susa and he had taken over basically the Persian Empire uh but Darius had escaped so Alexander used that fact as an excuse to continue conquering Asia because Darius fled into Central Asia into areas that we would now perhaps call Afghanistan and that sort of area of the world um and Alexander pursued Darius and claim and continued to conquer tribe after tribe and nation after nation um and eventually he came across Darius dead Darius had been actually murdered by one of his own generals who had who had continued to follow him and then Alexander the Great used getting revenge on that general for turning on his king as further excuse to continue his conquests and uh once that was taken care of he just kind of continued into India um basically because he just wanted to take over Asia. Uh, he kind of had a lot of, um, he kind of had a god complex. He kind of had, uh, delusions of grandeur, so he continued this huge conquest. Um, and he would have continued further into India, and by the way, India in this case is, uh, w what Alexander knew as India is really what we would today call, like, Pakistan. Um, so it's not the modern state of India that much, but more, more Pakistan and Afghanistan area, um, and he would have continued further into India, into probably what we would now call India, uh, if his soldiers hadn't gotten tired and sort of, um, not necessarily mutinied outright, uh, there was a mutiny at one point, but the, the uh, inciting incident for Alexander finally turning back to go back home from his campaigns was, uh, his soldiers sort of stopping and telling him that they were tired and, and were kind of sick of, of being in Asia all this time and wanted to just relax, um, so that's what prompted Alexander to finally turn around, um, and he turned around, went back to uh, to Persia, and settled down in Babylon, which he had made his the capital of his now huge empire, um, and was planning an invasion of Arabia, uh, and then died <laughs> under mysterious circumstances. Again, sort of like his father, he died of some kind of illness, it's unclear. He didn't really leave uh, an heir, and he didn't name one of his generals as his heir. He did... He did um, have one illegitimate son uh, named Heracles, uh, and then he had, he, when he died, a wife of his, Roxana, was pregnant, and she did give birth to a son who was at one point declared king of Alexander's empire, but he, he really, he was, he died, he was killed by one of Alexander's generals uh, when he was 13, and basically what happened to Alexander's empire is that it was just carved up by his generals, and um, they all sort of founded their own uh, little, uh, many empires of their own most famously that uh, you uh most famously uh ptolemy who uh one was one of alexander's right hand men um he founded the ptolemaic dynasty in egypt which is the dynasty that would later produce uh cleopatra so that is sort of that's what happens i mean there are a lot of there are a lot of other things in this volume you know he does go into a lot of detail about the different nations that alexander conquers different his battle tactics obviously um he describes geog the geography of the places he passed through. Even just uh, Arian even describes some of the sort of flora and fauna of a couple areas, which is interesting. But yeah, so there there's a lot in here, and it is a really uh, important historical document. Um, but I mean, it's important to keep in mind that Arian is not unbiased. Uh, he was a big fan of Alexander the Great and wanted him to look good, and uh, like I've already sort of alluded to, he did inflate the numbers of some of Alexander's enemies to make him look better <laughs> than he was necessarily, like he was facing uh, greater odds than maybe he necessarily was. He, he also um, downplayed some of the atrocities that Alexander committed. Alexander was um, not a benevolent ruler, per se. Uh, there was uh, one incident in particular where Alexander uh, slaughtered the population, uh, or much of the population of Thebes, the Greek city-state, um, who 
rebelled uh, very soon after Alexander became king. So before Alexander had the chance to begin his campaign into Persia, Thebes rebelled because they weren't happy with their um, new Macedonian overlords because, again, they had just been taken over by Philip, Alexander's father. And so they rebelled, and Alexander uh, put down the rebellion and then um, killed a lot of innocent people. Um, and Arian tries to... Uh, lay the blame more on uh, the Greek mercenaries in Alexander's army rather than on Alexander himself and the Macedonians in his army. Um, so th th stuff like that is peppered throughout. Um, but again, the nice thing with the critical volume, and I'll again mention, men talk about that more in a minute, uh, is that you have editors to sort of explain this stuff to you where maybe Arian is bending the truth, where he perhaps contradicts himself, where he contradicts other sources that we have on Alexander, um, and stuff like that. Um, just some other general notes on, on this as a reading experience. Some parts of it do get kind of tedious. You know, again, Arian goes into a lot of details, uh, over the different campaigns that Alexander gets into, you know, when it, you know, sometimes it's easy to get bogged down in, oh, he went and conquered this tribe, and then he moved to this place, and then he conquered this tribe, and then he went here, and then this tribe surrendered him to him peacefully, so he accepted their surrender and allowed the king to continue to rule as long as he paid tribute or something. And, you know, when you're in the midst of that for, like, 50 pages, it does get a little bit tedious. Um... But some of the battles are great fun to read about. Again, the military cat tactics are are very interesting. Um, so parts of it do read like a like a great like a, a gripping novel novelistic experience. Um, so yeah, it, it, there are parts that drag, but on the whole, it, it is it is makes for good reading. Um, and uh, the other thing that I always just find fascinating about reading about Alexander the Great is just Alexander the Great as a character just fascinates me. Um, you know, you know, he was a megalomaniac, um, and he's one of the few people where you can sort of say that he sort of had a, he had almost a good reason to be a megalomaniac, because again, he did win a lot of great military victories, he never lost a battle in his life, which might just be because he died so young, but still, um, he had a lot of delusions of grandeur, you know, he believed he was the son of Zeus, or the son of Dionysus, or both, um, and uh, he also uh, really played up the fact that he was supposedly descended from Achilles. Um, he was selfish. I mean, he led his men on this long campaign through much of a lot of inhospitable territory in Asia, through, you know, the uh, Hindu Kush in India, um, just simply be for his own personal glory. But I mean, on, to on top of all these negative aspects, he also has this weird sense of honor. I mean... You know, he was very generous to enemies who surrendered to him. He would allow them to, he would allow conquered kings or defeated kings to continue to rule their realm as long as they were, you know, subservient to him. Um, you know, when he captured the daughter and wife of King Darius in his, per in his campaign against the Persians, he said that they must be treated the same way that they would have been treated when they were with Darius. Um, and that, you know, very courteous, <laughs> you know. Um, and also, um, when uh, when he was crossing back to Persia from India, there was um, he he decided to take his army across this uh, region. Gedroja is the name of this this region, this desert region with very little water. That he decided he wanted to take his army across to get back because no other military commander had been able to bring their army across it, um, and he wanted to outdo all of the other great military commanders. Um, and uh, there was very little water. Many of his men died of dehydration. Dehydration, um, and Arian plays up this this incident where Alexander's soldiers, two of Alexander's soldiers, um, brought him a helmet full of water to drink, and he turned it down because he was like, "Well, if my soldiers can't drink, then I won't drink." And Arian plays this up as this like one of the most noble things that Alexander has ever done that he that he's going to suffer with his soldiers. And I'm sort of sitting here like, "Well, you know." They, we, none of them would be in this situation if you hadn't insisted on invading India or hadn't insisted on taking this really dumb route through this desert back to, to back to Persia. Um, so it was it was there there were supposedly reason good reason for him to take to take the route across the desert because the only other route was across the Hindu Kush mountains, which are inhospitable at that time of year. But I mean, you could wait until the Hindu Kush wasn't so inhospitable. I don't know, but it's just like. They wouldn't be in that situation if Alexander didn't need to, you know, fulfill his fantasy of conquering the world. Um, 
So anyway, that that for me, that's always what's most fascinating about reading about Alexander. It's just him as a person. He he fascinates me. That's my discussion of Arian. I also just want to give at the end a really good plug for this uh, edition. So this is the landmark campaigns of Alexander, and this is a series published by Pantheon Books. This particular volume was published in 2010. This volume was edited by James Rome. The translation by was by Pamela Mensch, and the translation, by the way, the translation is great. It's, uh, you know, you could hardly tell it was written in the second century AD. It was, it's written in the, in the prose and English like a modern historian would write for a popular audience. It, it's, the translation is really good. Um, and, uh, this volume also, um, has copious footnotes, as you can see where footnotes belong on the foot of the page. Um, it has maps, um, all throughout, maps all throughout. You can see there, um, and it'll, uh, it'll have maps of Alexander's campaigns themselves, obviously. Um, so, you have there all of his campaigns in one map. Um, there are, um, diagrams of battles as well. Let me see if I can find you one. Oh, it also has photos of, you know, interesting, interesting locations or artifacts, um, and little blurbs beneath them to tell you what they are, and here, diagrams of battles, uh, which makes it really a lot easier to understand what's going on in the battle. At least for me, I have a hard time f processing spatial movements through writing, so having a map like these uh, to tell you what's going on is just super helpful. Um, so you can see there are like arrows telling you which unit is going where, and also this these uh, points up here are telling you what these different arrows mean, and yeah. Uh, and then to top it all off, there are uh, 18, I think, essays in the back of this book, all by modern Alexander the Great experts, um, just on a variety of subjects. Um, you know, there's one about Aryan sources for, for writing this book. Um, there's one about Alexander's finances. Um, there's uh, one about his death, how he died, um, what happened in the aftermath of his death. Um, and just all sorts of things. So, and it also has a, <laughs> just, uh, it also has a, an encyclopedic index with just, yeah, the, telling you different names, defining terms, etc. And so, so this is just a great volume to have if you're going to read Arian. So I highly recommend this volume if you're going to read Arian. And I would say that if you're interested in Alexander the Great, this book is probably a must read. So, yeah. That is Arian. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, if you have thoughts, let me know. If you've read it, if you want to read it, let me know again. Uh, and uh, I will talk to you all in my next video. Bye, guys.